and lab with the Inception Institute of Artificial Intelligence. Um, at spin of Kepler Vision Technologies, he acts as the chief scientific officer. He's also the director of the master program in artificial intelligence and um, the co-founder of the Netherlands Innovation Center for Artificial Intelligence. Um, he was previously a visiting scientist at Carnegie Mellon University and UC Berkeley, head of R&D at University Spin of Few Vision Technologies and managing principal engineer at Qualcomm Research Europe. His research interests focus on video and image sensing. He has published over 200 reference journal and conference papers and has been on the editorial board of several international journals and frequently serves as an area chair of the major conferences in computer vision and multimedia. Professor Snook is the lead researcher of the award-winning Media Miller uh, semantic video search engine, uh, which was the most consistent top performer in the yearly NIST track bit evaluations for over a decade. He was a general chair of the ACM Multimedia 2016 in Amsterdam and initiator of the Video Olympics. Um, Kess is a recipient of the NWO Veni Career Award, a Fulbright Junior Scholarship, and the Netherlands Prize for ICT Research. Together with his PhD students and postdocs, he has won several best paper awards. Um, so we will now play a presentation recorded by um, Kess, and afterwards we'll have the Q&A session in place. Hello, everybody. My name is Kees Snook. I'm from the University of Amsterdam. I would have loved to meet you all in person today, uh, but Corona decided otherwise. So I'm going to deliver a pre-recorded talk, which feels a bit awkward, um, but we will have the opportunity for some real online uh, interaction afterwards. And today I would like to talk about unseen uh, video understanding. So video is uh, everywhere and uh, things uh, will only get worse. Um, so the internet of things that video is, uh, is upon us, so to say, and essentially any uh, device uh, that can fit a camera uh, and a purpose uh, will get one. So it has been estimated that by 2022, so that's uh, shorter than two years from now, there will be 45 billion cameras uh, in the world. And obviously all these streams of uh, video uh, need to be analyzed, so cannot be done uh, manually. So it requires uh, automated uh, inspection. And uh, with it, lots of interesting and uh, futuristic uh, applications become uh, feasible. So an obvious example are self-driving cars, right? So uh, they come with uh, several uh, sensors. So besides radar and, and, and LIDAR, a camera is a very important sensor for self-driving cars, as the cameras are typically the cheapest sensor and provide a good uh, ability to sense uh, the environment. So a typical car comes with multiple uh, cameras, so not only to look uh, what is happening in, in, in front of the car, but also on, on the sideways and on, on the back uh, of the car. Another urgent uh, application is uh, forensic, so in, in analyzing uh, terrorist uh, behavior. So right, uh, this is show some footage uh, from the bombing in uh, Brussels uh, airport. So. Um, of course, you cannot prevent it uh, by, by looking uh, uh, through the video, but afterwards, after the fact, you can analyze uh, where did the one that got away uh, go and can we track him back by following over multiple cameras that have tracked uh, the person's uh, behavior. Uh, this is another example showing uh, traffic surveillance, so keeping track of uh, what is happening on uh, on highways and, and, and streets, and uh, not only to prevent uh, that uh, cars uh, or people behave uh, wrongly, but this is also a very good 
tool to monitor on what roads do we need to change uh, the layout so as to assure a uh, better flow of uh, traffic and prevent uh, accidents. This is an example I like uh, a lot uh, myself, and this is uh, for well-being and especially monitoring uh, elderly uh, people. And this example is actually from uh, a project that was done at uh, Carnegie Mellon University, the Care Media Project, already uh, in early 2000s, uh, where they were equipping an elderly uh, care facility with, uh, with cameras. Uh, to keep track of the behavior uh, of the people and so for, for several purposes. So one of them, for example, was to, to see whether uh, they would show repetitive behavior and uh, repetitive behavior in elderly people is a sort of like an early sign of start of uh, dementia, right? So with, with the help of, uh, of camera observation, they had the vision potentially to, to, to recognize where the people showed signs of, of dementia or start to wade through, through the facilities, uh, so to say. Um, a, a very current uh, application is uh, to use uh, a video analysis to, to check uh, whether people comply to the social distancing uh, uh, rules that have been uh, established uh, uh, everywhere. So this is a good tool for uh, policy makers to check oh, and what, uh, what areas of cities do we need to uh, provide a different way of traffic, to organize the traffic different, differently to assure uh, that people can keep a sufficient uh, distance. Yet another example is the, the monitoring of social media. So it has become so easy to share videos on, on outlets like YouTube, TikTok, uh, Facebook and uh, what ha what have we? Um, and sometimes these are, are funny funny videos uh, of, of cats or showing uh, uh, imageries of the of the family. Uh, but sometimes people also abuse uh, these challenges to really post uh, atrocious uh, content. And currently, uh, social media websites like Facebook and uh, YouTube hire uh, human observers. Who have to flag the content as uh, in, inappropriate. So automating this would be really, really welcome. And then uh, last but not least, this is an application from Amazon uh, from a concept store uh, that they had in uh, Seattle. So basically employees could walk in uh, into the store with their uh, employee uh, ID card they could grab uh, the groceries that they wanted to have, put it in their uh, bag and walk out. So without the need to, uh, to go to a cashier and, and, and pay, for, uh, pay for the objects. So as you can see from the image um, here in top, it's full, uh, it's full of cameras. So the cameras keep uh, track who's coming in, they track the person and because you have checked in with your employee ID card, they know for each person who, uh, who they are. Uh, they track your behavior uh, in the shop and also they track what you pick from, from the shelves of the, of the shop. And so they will charge you uh, on your credit card and without you need, needing to pay explicitly. So these are all uh, futuristic uh, applications uh, that, that use uh, video understanding uh, technology. What do we all need to, to automate this? So basically, essentially the goal is to understand what is happening in the video, where, when, and also eventually why. So to really capture the intention of, of what, is, what is going on. Now, this topic has been studied for a long time uh, in, in computer vision and, and multimedia analysis. And, and recently we have made a lot of uh, 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 progress. So let me first tell you a little bit about uh, uh, the status quo in, 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 in general uh, video understanding. So this uh, shows, shows a picture of a tabula rasa. And this is a device uh, that was popular in the, in the Roman uh, Empire. 
because what you could do here is um, it is made of uh, 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 wood and together with some wax. So you could melt uh, the wax, you could write in it, and when you no longer needed the writing, you could melt it and you could re uh, reuse it. So every time you start with sort of a, uh, a blank a blank slate. And this blank uh, slate is uh, also a uh, hypothesis in, in how, how our brain uh, works. And this has inspired philosophers uh, uh, for quite a while, dating back to uh, Aristotle and probably uh, earlier. Um, and that there is a debate. So some people believe that the human brain behaves like a tabula rasa. So we are born with a blank uh, slate and based on our sensory uh, uh, perception, uh, we fill the brain with observation and that is that what makes us uh, think. And then there is also the other side on the debate where they say, well, the brain is actually comes uh, with innate uh, knowledge, innate ability, um, that helps us uh, understand how, how the, the world uh, works. At the moment, the in video understanding, the empirical uh, way or the sensory way of, 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 of looking at the brain is, uh, is the most popular, right? So um, this is the, the, the famous paper uh, from uh, Nature on, on deep learning uh, by Lecun, uh, Benjo and uh, Hinton. And they have established a revolution, uh, not only in computer vision, but also in, in video understanding and many, many other fields. So deep learning is also the way to go in, in, uh, in, in video understanding. Here's an example of uh, uh, one of the most cited papers in all of the sciences. So this is uh, the, the deep uh, ResNet which is a popular approach for images, but also very useful for, for video analysis. And to give you some highlight of, of achievements, of progress in the field of uh, video understanding, I'll show you some, uh, some videos. So this is actually uh, a, a clip from a work from people at Facebook. So they classify short uh, trimmed uh, actions, so short clips containing an action and they, they label it. Um, and as you can see, it does so in a very uh, reliable way. So the, the classification score is given together with uh, the action category. And as you can see, the scores are high and makes hardly any, any uh, mistakes. Uh, and the underlying uh, mechanism here is the, called C3D. So that's essentially a, a 3D convolution uh, over uh, spatiotemporal uh, uh, pieces of video data rather than the 2D convolution that is common in, in, in imagery. Um, here's another uh, example also from uh, Facebook. So this is the slow fast uh, network that was proposed at ICV 2019. So this is a, an even better version than uh, C3D that is not only able to classify uh, activities that happen in in a video, but also objects and is also able to localize activities in a spatial temporal uh, fashion. So the slow pathway operates on a low frame rate, so to really capture spatial semantics, and the fast uh, pathway is operating at a high frame rate uh, to capture motion uh, and, at, a, at a fine temporal uh, resolution. And it also tries to mimic uh, the fast and the slow pathway that is apparently also uh, present in the human brain. This is a video um, showing state-of-the-art results of some recent uh, uh, trackers. So in tracking, the idea is that uh, you provide uh, a box around uh, an object of interest that you want to track in the first frame. And then uh, once you have established um, uh, this box, you start to, to track it. So here we have a box around uh, Yoda and we start to track it with multiple uh, state-of-the-art trackers. And what you can see is that the trackers do a really good uh, job. So even when there is a camera uh, a position changes, the object is still recognized. Here the object has disappeared. Some trackers say, well, it must be somewhere in the middle. And here Yoda comes back 
and two out of the three trackers are even able to relocalize uh, the object despite the long uh, absence. So this is really, uh, really amazing progress uh, thanks to uh, deep learning and Siamese uh, networks. So I believe you're gonna come back one more time and let's see whether the algorithm is able to catch him. Yes, indeed, there he is again. And also note the, the big change in motion. So it's still, still doing a good, uh, uh, good job. So when I started as a PhD, it was sort of like unimaginable that it would be so that it would become so good. Um, here's another example where, given uh, this is a work from Steve PR nineteen uh, uh, from my lab actually. So where input is uh, find a woman in purple uh, dress uh, who's running, and what the algorithm uh, will output is those pixels that belong to the actor and the action. Uh, that are uh, mentioned in the text. Now, does a reasonable uh, job is of course not perfect, and some uh, pixels on the on the dog are also segmented, but it's reasonable. And now, the beauty of this algorithm is that by changing uh, the sentence, while still uh, showing the same video, so now we change the sentence into a gray dog running on a leash during a dog show, we are still able uh, to find the the pixels of the dog also in this case, rather than the woman running in the in the purple dress. And while this may seem simple, please notice that this is a recording at a dog show, so there are also many dogs uh, appearing in the background. So the, the the algorithm had really figured out that it should concentrate on the dog that is running uh, on the leash. So that is great progress in in in, in video understanding. So where are we? Where are we today? So this is a sort of like a simplistic uh, scheme, highlighting, showing two dimensions. So on the on the y-axis we have the dependence on uh, supervision, and on the x-axis we have the the level of our uh, understanding. And I would say that our understanding of of, of video, automated understanding of video, is is, is still quite uh, limited, right? So we can understand to some extent what action is happening in a short piece of video, but if we provide a very long sequence of video, it's very hard to really understand what is the spatial temporal, uh, what is happening in space and time. And also the big downside of today is that there is a huge uh, dependence uh, on labeled examples. Of course, the field is uh, moving, so slowly our understanding of video is becoming uh, better and better. Uh, but we are still, most of the improvements are based on creating a huge amount of uh, data, train and create a new task, train your model and show, show that it, it works. And this brings us uh, to a paradox, right? So as our understanding of video becomes more and more specific, it is unrealistic to assume that sufficient examples will be available to learn from. And the example I like to use is uh, this one, uh, where we have a, a video of somebody stealing uh, a bike. Now, of course, the intention of, of a bike thief is not to be uh, noticed, so you won't find an awful lot of video recordings of a person uh, stealing, stealing a bike. While such a de detector would be very useful, especially in Amsterdam, where stealing of bikes is very common, um, that you would be able to have a detector that recognizes whether your, your bike that is parked in front of the house uh, is taken away by, by somebody who, who has bad intentions. Now, now this is only labeling the entire video as, as, a, as, a, as a bike thief is active. But ideally, we also want to have uh, the actor uh, involved. So we would need boxes uh, for every frame. And maybe you want to label uh, the pixels uh, of the actor that is involved in the object. And maybe you're also interested in the consecutive uh, actions or the causalities uh, involved. So this is becoming a really cumbersome uh, annotation effort um, uh, for data that is hardly hardly available. So we are reaching uh, a dead end, right? So for complete 
complete video understanding, whatever complete uh, may be, but let's say it's very super precise and, and really uh, labeling anything you can think of. Um, supervision will not will not do do the job. I'm pretty confident that we will make progress along the the supervised uh, dimension, but I what I think really is is the, is, the, is the challenge is is the mission uh, of the field is to really get sort of like a complete video understanding by rely by relaxing the need for uh, supervision. Now, of course, there uh, this can be done in multiple ways. So one way is, uh, for example, point uh, supervision. So rather than providing uh, a box around any action of interest uh, in a video, you can do uh, different things. For example, first compute class agnostic uh, proposals, sort of like a hypothesis of potential pieces of video where an action uh, may occur. And then rather than providing boxes, you can ask an annotator to only provide points or sparsely sampled uh, frames. And with these points, together with uh, the set of proposals, you can come up with an algorithm that mines from the points and the proposal, the, the one proposal that maximizes, that matches best uh, with the point annotations. And in this way, you can reduce uh, the number of annotations. But you still have to find somebody who puts points on uh, successive frames. Another tactic is uh, meta-learning. So here what you do is you create an efficient use of the limited examples uh, you have and uh, you compute, uh, you specify a task, for example, few uh, recognize an object from a few examples and you repeat this process multiple times or so multiple episodes. And here the algorithm really likes to learn on a meta level how to solve uh, this problem. Downside of this is that you still uh, need uh, labeled examples. Another tactic that has been very popular uh, recently, also in video understanding, is uh, self-supervised uh, learning. So here, a typical tactic is that you come up with uh, a task that you derive from your data. For example, here, we, this is an image, but the same tactic also applies to, to video. For example, you rotate your input uh, image into uh, four classes, like uh, uh, normal orientation, 90 degree clockwise, uh, 180 degrees clockwise, uh, and, and so on. And you train your neural network to predict, to classify what is the orientation uh, of my image. And by doing so, you build a real strong uh, base uh, network that you can then fine tune in a subsequent step with the, the task of interest. Uh, and this will help you reduce the number of examples, but of course you still need examples for, for the task that you're interested in. Now, we, uh, we want to cover unseen uh, video understanding in, in this talk, and then uh, the tactic of choice is often uh, zero-shot uh, learning, which is typically resolved by attributes. So here you see an a example uh, for images with uh, zebras and pandas and, uh, and whales, and then they are specified by their attributes, right? So a zebra has black and white stray, uh, stripes, uh, a panda is also black and white, uh, lives on land, and, 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 and so on. And then for an unseen class where you only are provided uh, with the attributes, you can still infer that it must be a certain uh, animal, by using class to attribute mappings that you obtain, for example, from uh, Wikipedia or some other uh, knowledge source. Um, attributes do have uh, downsides, so they are difficult to define. You still need to label uh, the uh, attributes, uh, requires holdout data for training your attribute classifiers, and they are typically defined uh, uh, globally. So they are not completely ideal for, for video. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, alternatives uh, for, uh, for attributes and alternative ways to do unseen uh, video understanding. And uh, like attributes, we also use uh, knowledge transfer as the, as the main trick. The knowledge has to come from, from somewhere, uh, but luckily there are many sources that we can uh, leverage. So I will talk about uh, four of such uh, 
and other sources. So the talk has four parts. I will first discuss object uh, knowledge transfer, so as a, as a contrast with, with attributes. Then I will talk about hierarchical uh, knowledge transfer, so knowledge that is captured in, in, in knowledge hierarchies, ontologies. Then we will move on to learning from the laws of uh, physics. And finally, I will talk about what does the temporal dimension of, of, of video uh, uh, can add uh, to our efforts. So our first tactic uh, for unseen video understanding is based on the transfer of knowledge from objects. And the inspiration basically comes from has a lot to do with language. So uh, most object categories are, are common across cultures and this leads to also similar formation uh, across languages. Also a very interesting uh, observation from child development is that language development in children is that children first learn objects or so the naming of, of, of nouns. And once they have uh, sufficient vocabulary of nouns, they start to use uh, verbs. And uh, last but not least, object labels and, and classifiers and detectors uh, for images are, are commonly available thanks to uh, progress in, in, in computer vision uh, for, for image, uh, image data. So all this uh, in, in inspired us to look into the utility of, of objects, object classifiers and object detectors. Uh, as a, as a resource for unseen video understanding and as an alternative to uh, commonly used uh, attributes. And um, uh, a few years ago, we proposed uh, a method that allows you to go from, from objects uh, to actions. And how do we go about? So we have, uh, we use word uh, embeddings uh, spanned by a Skipgram model or word to vec uh, model uh, of 15,000 object uh, categories. So essentially we trained object uh, classifiers on all the example categories from ImageNet that had more than 100 uh, examples uh, to learn from. So by doing so you can classify each frame uh, in a video as belonging to one of 15,000 uh, object categories. So essentially for every frame you can predict uh, 15 15,000 dimensional uh, uh, vector with scores corresponding to the presence of certain object uh, categories. Then you can compute an affinity between objects or nouns and actions by relying on, on textual uh, resources like a Google News Corpus or Wikipedia. And then you can compute with the appropriate uh, metric uh, you can uh, compute uh, a word to vec uh, distance, uh, for example, and simply using uh, the cosine similarity uh, between the two, uh, or the inner product between the two vectors of the object and, and the action. And um, this basically works uh, really well, as we showed uh, a few years uh, back. And if we compare this uh, with, with attributes, and the result is quite uh, quite impressive. So here you see uh, the results for uh, action attributes and note that they need to be trained on the holdout uh, set. So we split uh, the videos for this particular uh, data set, UCF 101, uh, into two sets, the even and the odd uh, partition. We train on, on the even one to train our attributes and we test it on the, on the odd set. And we get an accuracy of uh, about 16%. And if we do it the other way around, it's about uh, the same. But when we train uh, on, on ImageNet, so the object annotation from ImageNet, so no videos are, are, are needed here, just labels uh, for images, uh, we can build a reliable uh, noise transfer methodology that uh, doubles uh, the accuracy compared to using uh, uh, attributes. And of course, then you can do all kinds of funny things. So here we show some uh, results uh, where we are trying to retrieve uh, never seen uh, actions or never labeled uh, actions on, on TUMOS, which is another uh, action classification uh, dataset from the literature. Um, 
so here you see some e examples uh, uh, like fighting uh, in a ring dancing or martial arts uh, hit wicket so this is not a category in 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 two months but we could uh, use it um, with our methodology and I'm not an expert on cricket, but I've been told that not all of them uh, are, are correct. So while it looks like cricket, they are not necessarily the, the, the hit wickets. A nice thing uh, with object uh, classification scores is that you can also use them for action localization. So the spatial temporal localization of actions in, in, in video. And for that, you need to rely on uh, action uh, tube proposals. Well, you can get those in an uh, unsupervised uh, class agnostic uh, uh, fashion. Then you encode, encode all these uh, tuplet proposals with your object classification uh, scores. And then you can simply do the zero shot uh, prediction for all the tubes and select, uh, select the best one. So here you see some uh, examples uh, for such an approach. So this is uh, in green is the prediction from objects uh, to action, and in yellow is the is the ground uh, truth or the ideal results. You see another uh, example. So for the skateboarding, so it's also pretty pretty accurate. And then the third one is essentially failure case, where it has uh, decided that uh, uh, the tube uh, around uh, uh, the ball and, and the hockey uh, club is, is more uh, if indicative for the action uh, playing golf than uh, the person uh, box. Nonetheless, uh, here we show that with objects, it is also feasible to localize an action uh, in, in the video. So without using any local uh, annotations, we are able to localize actions in, in, in video in an unseen, uh, without the need to see any video during training. So that is quite nice. Um, of course, um, there is also object detectors. So, so far we have used object classifier scores, which are global for the entire image. But there is also progress in object detection. So a few years later, we considered, can we add also some form of spatial uh, object awareness uh, to, this, uh, to this embedding? And it turns out uh, we can. So we, we defined uh, three, uh, three priors, so three object uh, priors that we can recompute and use uh, for unseen uh, action recognition. So the first uh, object prior is the location of, of the actor. So what we do here, we simply use a, a person uh, detector, an object detector uh, for persons trained on uh, images. And we apply it on video frames uh, uh, from a video. And here the idea is that the, the higher the likelihood of an actor in the box, uh, the higher the overall action score, right? So if there is an actor, uh, in a frame, it is more likely that an, an action will, will, will happen. So we make our recognition of the unseen action proportional to the confidence that our uh, actor detector uh, has. Now, object prior two is uh, object uh, location. So in the same way that we use the affinity, the similarity between objects and actions in the object to action uh, idea, we can do the same thing also for uh, object detectors, right? So for each uh, for uh, each action, we can compute what are the relevant objects that typically co-occur in, in text, in textual uh, resources. And we again use the word embedding for the relevance. So how do we obtain our actor and object uh, detector? So uh, here we use a simple uh, faster RCNN uh, for bounding boxes and, and scores, and it's pre-trained on ImageNet and MS Coco. So again, all image uh, data sets, so we didn't use any uh, videos or, or, or labels. One of the objects, there are 80 objects in, in Coco. One is the person class, so that is our actor detector. And the 79 remaining uh, detectors are the ones that we use for, for uh, matching actors and, and objects. 
Then our third uh, prior considers uh, spatial relations. So we observe that uh, actions and objects have a preferred relationship. When they have a, when they have a relationship, the, they have a preferred spatial uh, configuration. Now we can mine this preference again from image uh, data sets. So what we do is we discretize the spatial relations into nine uh, relative positions representing uh, prepositions like in front of, uh, on top, uh, left of, etc., right off, above, blah, blah, blah. And uh, then what we do is we compute how often certain objects are in a certain configuration relative to a center box. And the center box then is a person uh, detector, for example. And here you see what we find, right? So bicycle typically is left below or on the right of a person. A traffic light typically appears above uh, a person and a skateboard is typically below a person or on, or, or, or on, the, on the body. Now, so then we use the jensen shannon divergence with base two log logarithm uh, to determine the extent to which of the nine dimensional uh, uh, grid cells is the best match and the more similar distributions the lower the, the divergence and the higher the score so that is the basic idea so here you see uh, a figure showing this in the intuition uh, behind this idea so there are two persons uh, detected in the indicated with the red box and they have different spatial relationships uh, with the detected skateboard right so here, uh, the skateboard is detected uh, uh, below uh, the person. And this one, for this particular uh, person box, the skateboard is detected left of uh, the person. Now, which one uh, should we trust, right, for, for finding the action skateboarding? Now, this is the prior uh, that we got uh, from our mining uh, of MS Coco. And because it's more similar uh, to this one, we give a higher preference uh, to this uh, box locations. That is the intuition. Now, how do we uh, combine all these uh, priors? So we, we, we jointly score the actors, the relevant objects, and the spatial uh, awareness. So this looks, looks a bit involved, but it's actually quite uh, simple. So we combine the actor uh, likelihood the relevant uh, objects given uh, the actor and then the preferred uh, spatial relationships. And what comes out of this is a most likely object uh, location or action location uh, given the three object uh, priors. We do this for every frame in the, in the video and then we simply uh, link individual boxes with the dynamic program using a Venturbi uh, algorithm. Now, how effective uh, are these uh, priors? So we did uh, an ablation and, and here you see the results. So the table might appear a bit complicated, but let me, let me explain it. Uh, so here we have the three uh, priors. So let's start with the first one, the, the, the actor uh, prior. So we're detecting persons in, uh, uh, in, in video. How effective is using this single prior for action uh, classic unseen action classification? So we can see that for action classification and for action localization, we get a, a better than random performance, but accuracy is still quite uh, low. So looking only at the person is not, not enough to define the action. Then we also look at what is the, uh, the preferred objects that co-occur with a person given a certain uh, activity and how many objects should we take into account, right? So we only take the most likely action. So if we like, let's say we are have an activity playing the piano, then obviously if you find uh, a piano, a piano detector is then very informative, uh, but you can also imagine more uh, uh, other activities where more objects uh, are of interest. So you can include two objects in your representation, five, 10, and, and, and so on. Um, and what we see is that uh, more is better. So for classification, five or, or 10 gives a good result. And also 
five or 10 is a good result for action localization. And then finally, we also add our third uh, object prior into the equation. So we also take the preferred spatial relationships uh, into account. And by doing so, we can further improve uh, the results. So we find that uh, five for this particular data set, so five additional objects is a good, uh, is a good setting. So object locations for both actor and, and object, so being spatial aware and also the spatial relationships really help to discriminate, uh, better discriminate unseen uh, actions. But we didn't stop with the three object uh, priors because we observed that um, the spatial priors enable spatial temporal unseen action localization, but they ignore a lot of context from surrounding object classes, right? So from the object to action uh, experiment, we knew that if we have 15,000 object uh, categories, they provide very valuable information. So, and in the spatial priors, we only have 80 uh, objects because that is the maximum number of objects in MS uh, Coco. So what we do next is we uh, expand uh, our object vocabulary with uh, 13,000 uh, object categories as learned from ImageNet. So these are global uh, classification scores that we leverage. And then we introduce three uh, additional priors that really focus on on trying to capture object uh, semantics. And what inspired us is the following uh, example. So uh, language is ambiguous, uh, so object and action relations may be ambiguous too. So here we show two examples that uh, failed when we only used uh, spatial object priors. So for the activity uh, bar uh, swinging, uh, our embedding came up with a table as a very good object to include in the representation. Now, this is uh, not what we want, but how, was, how did this happen? Because uh, in bars, you typ typically have tables and, and chairs. So uh, the WordNet uh, affinity score indicated that table, which is one of the objects in, in, in MS Coco, is a good, uh, is a good object uh, when, when you're looking for bar uh, swinging, which is obviously not, not the case. And also for the activity uh, kicking, um, the word to vec embedding came up with a tie, and, and tie is typically uh, uh, the end result of a, of a game, like, uh, like, like soccer, where you can have a draw, which is a tie. Uh, but as it happens, uh, in Coco, there is a tie uh, detector, but that is a tie that you wear when you go to a formal, a formal location. And as it happens, the, the referee, uh, indicated over here, was wearing uh, a tie. So the tie detector fired on the, on the referee, but he was not the one who was kicking. So ambiguity of, of language and the limited availability of uh, objects in the vocabulary really uh, hurt uh, the, the unseen recognition, uh, so to say. But this can be resolved to, to a certain uh, Extent. So to combat uh, uh, the semantic ambiguity, we uh, use a simple observation uh, where objects tend uh, to have the same formation across languages. So it is, uh, but for some languages, there may be uh, a, a special ambiguity that is language specific. So if you average over multiple languages and do your embedding over multiple uh, languages, you factor out these accidental uh, ambiguities. So what we did is uh, we relied on uh, fast text. So this is a multilingual uh, uh, word embedding uh, package. And we computed the object and action uh, affinities uh, using fast text in multiple languages. And we experiment with up to five uh, languages in total, there are more than 150 languages uh, in the in the package. So, uh, uh, what did what did we find? So here you see uh, different settings for action uh, classification, and here the results with different uh, language. 
Now we get best results uh, for English, independent of, of the setting. And for the other languages that we tried, uh, results are a little bit uh, lower, probably because there is a lot of effort has already been put in in making English uh, translations uh, uh, good. And for, for Dutch and Portuguese, maybe the quality of the, of the, of the languages is, 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 is uh, uh, worse. Um, but then interesting, when we start to combine uh, the languages, we get better results. Um, especially uh, for this particular situation, when we combined English uh, and Dutch, we got the best uh, uh, results, even better than combining it with all, all languages. So the effectiveness per language uh, varies, but being multilingual in your embedding really pays, uh, pays off. So here you see uh, an example for the activity field hockey uh, penalty. And here you see the, the similarity for several objects given the action and also including a few uh, mistakes. So here we have uh, field artillery, panel institution, uh, field pansy. So somehow part of their uh, name corresponds to the activity name, which is not necessarily a good uh, thing. And when we combine the English language with also with the Dutch language, we can see that the similarity score changes. And the ones that are not the ideal matches get downgraded into their scores. So the, the good matching objects get better score and the not so good, the more ambiguous objects get, get lowered. So this really works. Then second uh, prior, semantic prior that we introduced here. So semantic similarity does not necessarily imply discriminative uh, ability, right? So when you are on a soccer field and you find that grass is very uh, informative, uh, that is true, but grass is also informative for many other sports. So, so a grass classifier is not the best one you can pick uh, to identify uh, kicking activities, for example. So we introduced two uh, score functions to take this discriminability into account. So the first one penalizes objects that are not unique uh, for, an auction, uh, for an action. And the other one promotes objects that have a high uniqueness across the entire set of objects, regardless of their match to the action, right? So if, if, if an object is, is, is very rare, but for a particular video, it has a high score, then we think that is a, that is a good thing. And um, so the score function uses um, uh, the uniqueness of, of the objects over the entire uh, sets. Now, what, did, what we, we find in terms of their effect, so again, for different settings uh, in unseen action uh, classification, uh, and we find that uh, it adds a little bit. So not, not spectacular uh, increase when adding the action-based discrimination and the object-based discrimination, but all small uh, bits help in unseen uh, video understanding. So nonetheless, we think this is an effective uh, prior. And here you see some uh, effects after uh, using this uh, prior. So here we have the activity apply eye makeup and here we have the activity pizza tossing. And indeed, after applying these prize, you see that the relevant objects uh, get enforced. So that is the, the gray uh, uh, bold uh, uh, classes, while the less relevant uh, ones indicated with uh, red uh, get downgraded. Uh, so in fact, one of the classes here is, is, is pizza where, where here, uh, you have uh, things like horse that, uh, that, that get downgraded, so it makes a lot of sense. Then the, the third semantic prior, last uh, prior that, that we use is uh, the one that is using semantic naming, right? So here we exploit the preference uh, in language for naming uh, objects. So basic level categories uh, are often uh, uh, preferred. So uh, for example, here we have a referee, which you would call a referee, but you can also use the, 
the term adju adjudicator, right? It is less, far less uh, common. But if I tell you it is a referee, everybody understands. If I use the other word, it's much more, much harder uh, for the general individual to know that this is a, is a synonym for, for, for referee. So using these basic level uh, names, which you can easily find in uh, WordNet uh, ontologies, is really helpful for uh, representation as well. Um, so we did an experiment where we uh, emphasized object uh, naming and we tried uh, uniform sampling, emphasizing on specific uh, names, so low in the hierarchy, generic names like uh, uh, high in the hierarchy, so very abstract, and using basic level uh, naming. Um, at first we were surprised that uniform was doing so well compared to uh, basic level, but then we figured out that as we were using ImageNet, uh, uniform sampling there already sort of like gives a high bias towards uh, basic level because ImageNet is biased towards uh, basic level object uh, names. Um, so this also adds uh, to unseen recognition. So short uh, recap on object priors. So we have defined uh, six. So we have the actor location, object location, spatial relation, and then we have semantic uh, priors for ambiguity, discriminability, and object uh, naming. Then the question comes, when should you apply what uh, uh, a prior? So that is uh, displayed over here. So we have the object, uh, the spatial object priors and the semantic object priors, and we compare their utility for both unseen action classification and unseen action localization. So um, what this shows is that, well, the, the semantic prior, so the global classification scores are, are better uh, than the local ones. So compare the 59.6 with the 29.8 uh, over here. That makes a lot of sense because here we have 13,000 of them and these are only 80. It also shows that with the spatial priors, you can do both classification and localization, obviously with only the semantic priors, so the global scores is very hard to do localization. Uh, but the best thing you can do is combine the spatial object priors with the semantic priors, and you get a really big jump in, uh, in accuracy, both for classification and localization. So let's look at, uh, at some results. So here you see three three activities and uh, uh, and their localization result and classification results. So here the top local object is a, is a skateboard for this activity skateboarding. Here it is a uh, boat for the activity uh, diving. And here it is a tennis racket for the activity golfing. And that is obviously a uh, mistake. Besides, Unseen action recognition, classification, localization, it also enables a new task. So uh, basically, when having this embedding, we can also now query our sets of uh, videos and, and look for particular activities and also indicating spatial relationships. For example, find those videos where there is a backpack appearing on an actor, right? So this is the query, and this is a typical result that you could uh, expect, where you find uh, a video indicating also the location of both the object of interest, in this case, the backpack, and also in the preferred spatial location, where it is on an actor. Another example is uh, find a video where a sports ball is uh, uh, with a, si a size indicator of a relatively small, uh, where it is on the left uh, of the actor. So because and uh, we have the bounding boxes. We also have a sort of a crude approximation of what is the relative uh, size. So this allows to, to ask new type of uh, questions. And again, this is without uh, any uh, video labels. Um, now then you have to show that it works better than uh, alternatives. So we get uh, pretty good numbers for uh, zero shot uh, action classification using the, the most popular evaluation uh, settings. I think what is of interest is this comparison. So the first one, uh, Jane et al, uh, is from the objects to action uh, uh, work. So only using global object classification scores to build the embedding. 
Uh, then we have uh, an, uh, this one adds spatial uh, priors, so only the object uh, uh, location and the relationships that gives a small uh, increase. But when we combine the spatial priors and the semantic priors, we will get the best uh, possible result for action classification. And that doesn't depend on, on, on the setting. For all setting, it results in the best uh, number. So that, that's nice. And um, there's less work on unseen uh, action uh, detection. But here again, uh, combining all the priors uh, outperforms uh, related work on, on this uh, task. So we, we discussed uh, object uh, knowledge transfer, and now we move on to the, the next uh, topic. And it, 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 it relates a bit uh, to object knowledge transfer because we're also relying on, uh, we relied on, on WordNet already a bit, but here we dive a little bit uh, deeper and we focus exclusively on uh, knowledge transfer from hierarchies, so hierarchical knowledge uh, transfer. And this is based on a very recent paper uh, from my uh, lab uh, uh, that appeared at CVP, CVPR. So uh, the motivation is as uh, follows. So say we have a, a video of an activity uh, bait in uh, twirling and uh, for some reason it is uh, misclassified as uh, a balance now, standard uh, one hot based uh, training tells the model this sample is not a uh, balanced beam. Uh, this sample belongs to another uh, activity. However, when we use uh, an hyperbolic uh, embedding, uh, which uses also hyperbolic uh, training, it tells the model this sample is not uh, a balanced beam, but it also tells us it is sports, it is gymnastics, Right, so it it encapsulates the hierarchy. So rather than telling it's only the class, which can be wrong, it also tells you well in what in what hierarchy uh, does it uh, belong. So this was basically the motivation uh, for this work to use or to investigate hierarchies, and uh, luckily uh, action hierarchies exist in 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 the video understanding uh, literature, uh, but as it happens, they are not so often used. Uh, probably the most famous example is uh, ActivityNet. So this is a, a big effort to, to label uh, activities in a similar fashion as uh, ImageNet. Uh, it was based on also uh, on, a, on an activity uh, ontology and labels have been provided, videos, the ontology and also labels. Uh, the start and end of activities in, in video collections is provided for many classes. Uh, this resource has been used a, a lot in the literature, but mostly for the videos and the, and the action class annotations, uh, not so much the hierarchies. Um, there is also some uh, related work on, on using hierarchical uh, embeddings, uh, so to say. Um, of course, there is work without uh, embedding, so simply relying on, on, on work to vec. So the device from NeurIPS is, is, is famous. There is also work on uh, that is in Euclidean space. Uh, there's also work from my lab uh, working on hyperspheres uh, that appeared in NeurIPS uh, last year. And then there are a few uh, a few papers that use uh, hierarchies inside uh, their embedding. And the notable examples we found are uh, Lee et al. from CVPR 2019. So they have, uh, they generate a tree level uh, fixed hierarchy of uh, classes followed by a softmax uh, optimization uh, to perform hierarchical recognition. And then um, there is a, uh, I would say, more interesting work from Bart and uh, Denzler that appeared at uh, WECV who embed hierarchical relationships in a hypersphere, uh, also for uh, uh, unseen action recognition or retrieval, basically. Uh, and they show it improves over a, a setting that does not uh, use hierarchies. Now, this is all uh, inspiring because it tells us that hierarchies have value. And rather than using Euclidean simplex or hypersphere uh, embeddings, we prefer hyperboles because they provide a more suitable space uh, uh, for uh, 
action uh, search for unseen action search and especially as it can use fixed uh, or it can use variable uh, depth uh, uh, of the hierarchy so it no need to be uh, be fixed so we use a hyperbolic uh, action embedding and hyperbolic space can embed any hierarchy without information loss because it has this tree-like uh, property so the number of nodes grows exponentially to the tree depth and for a hyperbolic disk uh, the area grows exponentially to the radius so no matter how deep the hierarchy is there is always enough space uh, to contain a class um, we were not the only one to have the idea of using hyperbolic uh, embeddings for hierarchical uh, 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 inclusion. So there is uh, concurrent work. Uh, this is for image recognition, so not for, for video understanding that appeared in, also in CVPR. Uh, so if you're interested into this topic, then also check out those two papers. So um, our model is, is quite uh, simple. We embed uh, videos and action classes into a shared uh, space and then we match uh, videos uh, by doing so we can match videos to corresponding actions our shared space is a hyperbolic uh, disk so both the action embedding and the video embed embedding are hyperbolic uh, as well um, our model has four uh, steps so we embed uh, the actions into this uh, hyperbolic uh, uh, disk and also we match uh, and so do we do with the videos um, and then we map uh, them both into the same uh, hyperbolic disk so how do we go about uh, we use uh, two losses so the first loss is a hypernym hypernym uh, relation uh, loss so this is quite similar to what is uh, already known from the literature. So there are actually quite some papers on hierarchical embeddings uh, uh, used for natural language processing uh, problems. So we use the same uh, loss also in, in our case. But in addition to this uh, hypernym hypernym uh, loss, we also introduce a second loss, which uh, uses a uh, max margin uh, separation of non hypernym uh, classes um, so the main reason is that in, in 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 search we aim to be discriminative for the actions we are searching now for the video embedding um, we project videos on the same hyperbolic space so what we do is we first uh, feed the video to a 3d convolutional uh, network and here we use a resnext uh, model but you can use any model so it's really really important um, what is important is that the network output is uh, euclidean so we need to project it to the hyperbolic uh, disk uh, by using an exponential uh, map so this is a known uh, technique uh, to map Euclidean space into uh, hyperbolic space. Then we want to match action hierarchies with uh, videos and here we propose a hyperbolic uh, prototype distance uh, function. Um, it simply imitates the training process of uh, softmax uh, classifiers to match videos and actions. The main difference is that the training is based on the hyperbolic distance metric. Uh, so this is this D subscript uh, C. Once we have this, we can perform hierarchical action search. So given a certain uh, query, which can be an action name or a video example, you can rank videos in your, in your test set uh, based on, on, the, on the cosine uh, distance. And what this will result in is what we call a uh, cone uh, search whereby uh, we increase the cone so to say so you capture more and more information that is encapsulated into the hierarchy so you have the target cone uh, the sibling and also the the cousins right so the hierarchy of all of the classes is is slowly expanded um, 
we took some existing uh, data sets and hierarchies that we uh, uh, updated a, a little bit. So we have uh, ActivityNet, which comes with a hierarchy. We have mini kinetics that comes with a hierarchy and we have uh, moments in, in time. Uh, not all the hierarchies are complete. So we, we expanded them a little bit and made some corrections. They, uh, they are all available. Um, we fixed the uh, remove duplicates and the, these kind of things. And these are the final uh, statistics. So uh, Oracle ActivityNet then has uh, 38 parents and, and six uh, grandparents uh, for the 200 classes. Mini Kinetics has 33 parents and five grandparents. And uh, uh, moments is more uh, mixed. We also define three uh, evaluation metrics. The first one is the, the standard mean average precision. The second one is uh, the sibling uh, MAP. So it considers uh, which actions that are two hops away. Uh, so actions that are only two hops away from the ground truth are still considered uh, a positive because they are siblings. And then for the cousin MAP, the same metric, but then four uh, hops away. So the first task is uh, query by video. So the input is a query video. And then what we want to achieve uh, is a video showing similar activity. Notice that the activity label here is only indicated uh, to help you interpret the results. It is not seen during the, during the retrieval. Uh, so this is a marching video. And indeed, we find marching uh, videos, but we also find uh, sibling videos like cheerleading. Right, so uh, which is still better than showing something that is completely uh, different. So here we see some uh, mistakes. So here the input video is an archery video, but it's a rather awkward uh, viewpoint. So it starts to make uh, mistakes, and it also includes two two cousin uh, uh, activities. Now. Um, an important parameter in um, in the hyperbolic uh, embedding is the the value of the the curvature. Right uh, when the curvature is uh, zero, the hyperbolic space uh, resembles the Euclidean uh, space. Uh, the lower the curve, uh, the more Euclidean the space is, leading to a higher uh, MAP. Right, so that is what you see over here. So when the curvature is zero, the more Euclidean. So that is uh, that is good for uh, MAP, uh, but bad for sibling and, and, and cousin uh, MAP. And as we increase uh, the, the, the curvature, the the sibling and, and, and cousin MAP go go up, right? Uh, up till the moment point that uh, the curvature is too large, and then. Uh, uh, it starts to deteriorate. So some uh, curvature is preferred, but too much leads to uh, to instability, right? Then the question is, what should be the size of the of the hyperbole, so the hyperbolic dimension? So uh, if we have a standard uh, ResNex model that is trying to recognize the 200 classes in activity, it's obvious uh, it's 200 dimensional, right? Um, for uh, our hyperbolic embedding, we can pick, uh, we, we can check, we can uh, fix the dimensionality, so we can use 200 uh, equal to the, the ResNex standard, so to give a much better result. But also with uh, with only 50 uh, dimensions or uh, even uh, 10 dimensions, we are better than the rest next uh, uh, alternative. Um, so we get higher scores at the same uh, number of uh, dimensions, um, but we can also make our embedding much much smaller uh, without uh, loss in accuracy. Then we had two uh, loss functions. So the first one emphasizing the hyponym hyponym uh, relationships and the, the, the second one maximizing separability between action classes. And this table essentially shows that we really need, uh, need, need both. So if uh, lambda is our weighting parameter between the two, two losses, so if lambda is zero, uh, we are essentially a standard uh, loss for hyperbolic embeddings as proposed 
uh, initially by nickel and uh, Kila at, in NERVS 2017. So that results in a good uh, MAE uh, uh, P and especially sibling and, 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 and cousin uh, MAP. But when we add our discriminative loss into the mix, you can see that uh, these numbers, uh, especially for MAP, uh, go up. And for the other two, they uh, go, go down, may go down a bit. So it's really a trade-off depending on what you uh, prefer. If we, if we only focus on the second loss, then obviously we lose on the hierarchical uh, sibling and cousin uh, MAP. So they really need to be balanced. This gives some uh, insights in, in, the, in the similarities. So here, um, to evaluate whether we are actually learning hierarchical relationships, we show what we show here is the average video similarities for a subset of the actions of uh, hierarchical activity net. And we show the pairwise action similarities for our model and compare it to one trained with softmax uh, cross entropy on one hot vectors. So this is the one on uh, one hot uh, vectors and we see some clusters uh, pop up, right? Um, but it's not a good idea to really learn these from scratch. It's much better to, uh, to impose them, right? So here you see a much better uh, uh, clustering of related uh, actions. So really imposing the hierarchy uh, into the embedding has a, has a, a positive effect here. Uh, the problem is far from uh, solved. So here are some, some face failure cases. So here are two uh, queries. So the, the query shows a belly dancing uh, video and it finds things like hula hooping and, 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 and singing, so which are mistakes and also some, some good ones. And here's again, uh, this is a playing cricket uh, video, again, a weird uh, viewpoint. So then uh, it's hard to recover. Um, so what this tells us is that uh, hierarchical similarity uh, can help, uh, but visual similarity is still uh, crucial. So when the visual similarity overwhelms uh, uh, the hierarchical similarity and it's, it's, uh, it's a negative uh, similarity, so to say, in, as in this case, then the hierarchical similarity cannot uh, recover any longer. Um, here's the, the second task. So this is query by action uh, name, and this is also closer to unseen uh, uh, video understanding scenario, uh, where the query is like, uh, show me videos of uh, air drumming or laughing or uh, passing a football, and, but not in a game. And then you hope to find search results uh, like this. So dark green indicates the same class and lighter colors indicate sibling or cousin uh, Classes. And then we did uh, a comparative evaluation for uh, uh, the setting as well, where we really compare with the, uh, the Euclidean, the hypersphere, and the, and the simplex uh, representations. And then we see that uh, for all data sets and all metrics, uh, the hyperbolic embedding uh, outperforms uh, the alternatives. And this is in the query by action name scenario. And in the paper, we did a similar uh, experiment also for unseen actions and it shows uh, the same uh, results. So that ends the discussion on uh, hierarchical uh, knowledge transfer. And then we move on to the next topic. So we have... So we have discussed object knowledge transfer hierarchical knowledge transfer. In this chapter, we're going to discuss uh, knowledge transfer based on uh, physics. This is also based on a, a recent uh, CFPR paper from, uh, from my lab. So we have already shown that we have made a lot of progress in, in video understanding, but video understanding is not the only field who is making progress. So I'd like to show you some uh, intriguing examples from, from computer graphics. So here you can see that uh, these simulated uh, uh, environments are really becoming, to, starting to look really realistic, right? So real hard uh, problem of modeling uh, water and has done really a magnificent uh, uh, job uh, here. 
And here's another uh, example uh, showing um, uh, knitwear. And look how how how, how realistic uh, the texture and, and the bending and, and, and the material, uh, what it looks like. So this made us uh, wonder, so if we can use computer graphics like simulated uh, examples, simulated videos, we no longer need to meticulously annotate uh, uh, objects with a very imposed emanation texture and, and, and scene dynamics because we can all uh, put it into the model uh, from the start. So the model delivers it all for free. And this would facilitate uh, unseen uh, video recognition also. So uh, for this particular project, we had the research question, can we predict the, the, the latent physical properties for, for real world phenomena through simulation? without ever having seen a real video example uh, before. And uh, we focus here on, uh, on, on cloth uh, in the wind. So we consider flax uh, and cloth in the wind as a, as a case study. Um, and this is uh, important for uh, uh, applications like virtual clothing try-on, energy harvesting and, and biological systems. Uh, it's also well studied in the field of computer graphics. And the task is, uh, uh, while specific, it is still challenging as physical models of cloth tend to have high numbers of unknown parameters and, and bear an intricate coupling of intrinsic and uh, external uh, forces. So we are particularly interested in, in properties like uh, the fabric stiffness of, of the cloth material, uh, the, the, the area weight of the, of the fabric, and also the, the wind speed that we can predict from the behavior of So uh, the key idea that, that we were investigating is that um, we measure um, real world physical properties by iteratively refining uh, a physics uh, simulation so as to increase uh, visual similarity between a uh, generated uh, video and the real world uh, observation that we make with the camera. So how, how do we go uh, about? So uh, cloth has been studied a lot in, in, uh, uh, in the computer graphics uh, community. So we can borrow a lot of their uh, uh, models and most successful methods treat uh, cloth as a mass spring uh, model. So a dense grid of point methods treat uh, cloth as a mass planar uh, structure interconnected with different types of springs which uh, properties determine uh, the fabric's uh, behavior. Uh, and also simulation parameters uh, are uh, available. So the range of bending stiffness uh, is, is known. Also the weight of, of the fabric can be easily uh, estimated, for example, by looking at uh, uh, commercial web shops for vendors of, of cloth and, 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 and flax. And also we have a good sense of, of the, the wind velocity um, uh, and the variation therein. So given uh, these uh, parameters and then the spring, uh, the mass spring uh, model, uh, we start to simulate and, and render uh, simulated videos of, of cloth uh, in the wind. So we have some uh, simulation uh, parameter that's put in into a ArcSim uh, simulator. It generates uh, 3D uh, meshes of, of, the, of cloth uh, in the wind. And then we use uh, Blender as our uh, rendering uh, engine and together with rendering parameters like camera position, scene geometry, lighting conditions, uh, and the texture of the, of the visual cloth, we can generate uh, simulated uh, video clips of, of cloth in the wind like the ones you see over here. So here are some more uh, examples. Uh, and th these are ordered in terms of the increased uh, bending uh, stiffness uh, from left to right and the increased wind speed from, from top uh, uh, to bottom. So let me show you again. So here you see some uh, simulated uh, videos of, of a flag uh, uh, in the wind. Now we measure in unseen uh, videos, 
by using this iterative uh, same to real uh, procedure. So we record a, a real uh, video clip and we measure its uh, similarity into this physical uh, similarity embedding with an artificial uh, video clip. And uh, as the two clips become closer uh, and closer, then we know what were the parameters that were used for the simulated clip. So these parameters then must uh, ideally uh, uh, are, are those identical to the ones for the, uh, the real uh, video, the real phenomenon. So we create a data set of uh, random flag and clot uh, uh, simulations to learn this physical similarity uh, embedding. And uh, we map these rendered videos to an embedding with a CMEs network that we train with uh, contrastive uh, loss. And then this is the network architecture uh, that we have used. So given a 3D video volume as input, we first apply a zero to order uh, temporal Gaussian filtered filter, followed by two directional first order Gaussian derivative filters. And then we spatially subsample both filtered video volumes by uh, by factor two, and the spectral decompositions layer then applies the Fourier transform and selects the maximum power and corresponding frequencies densely for all spatial locations uh, in the image plane. So this produces 2D multi-channel feature maps, which we can then process with off-the-shelf uh, CNN blocks, and here we use uh, ResNet blocks. Uh, to learn the final uh, embedding. So once we have this embedding, then we can start to record uh, real videos and given uh, a set of simulation parameters, we can find uh, the video that's closest, uh, or we can find the simulated video that is closest to the real thing and then report uh, its uh, parameters. So we created some uh, data sets, one with uh, simulated flag and plot uh, videos. And we, used, we also recorded our own uh, real flag uh, video. So uh, Tom, the PhD student, uh, put uh, uh, an enamel meter into uh, uh, a flagpole and recorded uh, the, the flags also in, in windy conditions over a period of uh, a few days in, uh, in Amsterdam. So we have a data set with uh, flag recordings together with wind speed uh, ground truth. And we also uh, did experiments with uh, hanging clot uh, videos from a data set uh, by Baumann et al from ICV 2013. This does not contain uh, wind speed, but it does contain uh, fabric uh, measurements. And uh, measurements. And um, well, we have lots of experiments in the paper, but here I only want to report uh, uh, the, the final ones, the, mo the most interesting ones I would say is, so here you see the development. So this is the real uh, video of a flag in the wind for which we want to estimate, we want to predict the corresponding uh, wind speed. And we know the ground truth. In this case, it's uh, 2.46 uh, uh, meter per, per, per second. And as we iteratively go to our procedure, these are generated uh, clips. So simulated uh, clips of a flag uh, in the wind using similar uh, uh, textures. And as you see, it converges, as is visible here, to the true uh, measurement, or it's approximately similar to the 2.46 uh, meter per second uh, that we measured uh, uh, for real. And here we also estimate the fabric uh, weight, but we don't have, have the ground truth, so we cannot verify whether that is correct. Uh, for that, we have the other experiment with, uh, with the hanging clot. So this is the real videos, and these are the simulated videos. And also this one uh, converges uh, uh, quickly. And it's a little bit, uh, for the fabric uh, weight, it's a little bit higher than the ground truth, but it's approximately uh, correct. So. What is interesting here is that we have effectively closed uh, the loop uh, between learning from simulated uh, videos to predict uh, real world phenomena. So this is another way of uh, getting to unseen uh, video understanding uh, without the need uh, to label uh, data. In our final chapter, we consider the temporal dimension of uh, video for knowledge transfer. 
So what are the properties of uh, time in uh, video? So, well, first of all, there is a temporal asymmetry. There is a clear distinction between uh, the forward and the backward arrow of, of time. So here you see uh, two, uh, two videos, one in the, in the normal uh, forward direction and the other one in, in, in the backward correction. So you clearly see that the, the, the second one feels uh, 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 unnatural. Another proper property of uh, video time is temporal uh, continuity. So future observations are expected to be a smooth continuation of, of past observations. So this is again best visualized with two uh, videos. So this is uh, a video of a, of a snooker game. And uh, the left video shows uh, in continuous uh, mode. And in the second video shows non-continuous mode by swapping uh, two frames. And it clearly uh, breaks uh, your, your expectation when, when you look it. And, and third, and a very important one, is uh, temporal uh, causality. So when we observe an event, we actually observe a chain of causes and, and, and then effects. So this is well captured in the in the something something uh, data set. So here the action is pretending to put something uh, into something. And if you look at the ordered uh, versus the shuffled version, you yeah, it, 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 it really feels uh, un, unnatural. So these, these properties of, of video time can be uh, exploited uh, for unseen uh, video understanding. And in this uh, final chapter, I would like to focus and zoom in on temporal uh, continuity. Right, so the fact that uh, uh, video is uh, continuous and that we can exploit this. Um, so video is uh, continuous, so we can also exploit this continuity and also discontinuity um, by looking into uh, short uh, trimmed uh, videos and to learn from those videos to uh, be able to learn in longer videos where to find the action of interest without the need to have these uh, labels for the start. So that is the key idea we are uh, uh, considering here. So why would that be uh, useful? Well, so during training, you only need to have uh, short uh, trimmed uh, clips with their action labels, which are commonly uh, available. There is no need for uh, hard to obtain uh, and ambiguous uh, boundary uh, annotations. And there's also no need to look into very long uh, videos to really find where is the action of uh, interest. So uh, what, we, what we propose in, in, in this work is what we call uh, action bytes. So these are sequences, short sequences of interpretable uh, video segments, which have sort of a meaningful uh, boundary. And uh, in this work, we represent them as those uh, instances where affinities to latent concepts change uh, abruptly. And here are some action bytes uh, examples. So they are, it's important to realize they are class agnostic. Uh, they are inter interpretable uh, to some extent. They don't have a label, but they are interpretable. And they are temporally scale uh, invariant. So they can be uh, short, they can be a little bit longer, it can depend. So it's not, not a fixed. Uh, temporal window. So here you see some examples from uh, baseball match and, and please note that the labels we have sort of like provided uh, ourselves to give sort of like uh, the interpretation uh, of the segments. So here are the, the phases that uh, that are typical for, for baseball uh, uh, matches. And uh, we have an approach to learn these uh, action bytes and to help also to localize activities in, in unseen videos. Uh, so how do we go uh, about, right? So first we segment uh, a video into uh, action uh, bytes, and these are then uh, clustered uh, and assigned uh, pseudo labels, which are used as a supervision signal to train the localization uh, model, right? So we have action uh, bytes, which we extract, 
we cluster them and we use the pseudo labels which we feed as an additional label together with uh, the action class label for the short clips to optimize our localization uh, model. So for our localization model, we use an off the shelf uh, one that is uh, commonly used for weekly supervised uh, recognition. So we have an uh, auxiliary loss uh, for regularization and a loss based on the action uh, class uh, labels for the short clips. And the latent output uh, of this localization module is used to update uh, the action byte extraction. And we iterate a few times over this procedure to get better action byte, better clusters, better pseudo labels, and a better localization uh, model. Then in a cross dataset evaluation, uh, the label set of the of the scene uh, videos in the trim set should not overlap with the ones in the uh, in the test set. Uh, to be able to still be able to transfer uh, the label information, we use a similar trick as in the objects to action uh, uh, work. So basically, using uh, word to vec embeddings to measure uh, similarity between text uh, labels. Now, uh, the key abilities of uh, action bytes is that uh, they enable uh, temporal localization of. Uh, actions in a zero shot uh, fashion. So without the need to label any uh, videos a priori uh, with temporal uh, action boundaries. So we simply avoid, uh, uh, we do need to avoid class overlap between the, the trimmed and the untrimmed video seen at uh, test time. Action bytes also form good uh, action uh, proposals. So we can simply uh, merge consecutive proposals also in, uh, with temporal jittering. So we merge consecutive action by proposals to get reliable action uh, proposals. And also action bytes can be used for zero shot, but can also be used to improve existing weekly supervised uh, methods that use action class labels for long video to find the corresponding boundaries. Um, we did some ablations on what are the, the, the best settings uh, uh, for the action bytes. Um, it basically shows that um, as long as the clustering loss uh, decreases with the pseudo uh, labeling, you can keep on improving uh, your action bytes. And um, adding the action byte proposals also into the mix further improves uh, the accuracy. And here we see uh, some uh, results. So first on the proposed uh, task, so zero shot temporal localization. And as far as uh, I am aware, this is the first time uh, this has been tried in the, in the literature. So we also included a, a baseline that simply uses the, uh, the, the word to vec distance between the class activation score from Kinetics 400 uh, dataset used for uh, uh, training. And we compare that with our uh, approach and well, it's, it's obviously uh, uh, better and we reported on uh, two MOS, but also on multi two MOS, which is a multi-label action dataset and uh, activity net. Then we also plugged it into a state of the art weekly supervised uh, method and then adding action bytes uh, on top further improves weekly supervised results as well. And here we are also the first to report uh, weekly supervised action localization on, on multi tumors, which is enabled by our uh, approach. And uh, uh, last but not least, we can also do completely uh, uh, zero uh, shot with our approach. And those numbers are uh, low, there is no state of the art, uh, but it shows uh, feasibility uh, of the method. So that brings me uh, to the end uh, of this talk. So I've talked about knowledge transfer for unseen uh, video understanding. So can we understand video without relying on huge amounts of data and uh, complex architectures, with huge amounts of compute uh, to get to the semantic essence of what's going on? Uh, turns out that uh, priors uh, from object provide uh, effective uh, knowledge transfer, and so do uh, hierarchies. Uh, the laws of physics, as captured in uh, computer graphics, 
models and also the notion of uh, the temporal axis of, of video uh, provides interesting source of uh, information. So uh, knowledge transfer is of course key uh, for unseen video understanding. The, the knowledge uh, has to come from uh, somewhere. Um, objects, ontologies, physics and time are viable knowledge sources that one uh, can use. And what is nice is that they are naturally embedded or can be embedded in self-learned uh, representations so as to get the best of uh, both the deep learning world and uh, using informative uh, uh, priors. And uh, I believe we have only started to explore uh, the opportunities and a lot of uh, exciting work is, uh, is waiting uh, uh, for us. Uh, that ends uh, my tutorial. Thank you for your uh, attention and I'm happy to take uh, questions in the online uh, Q&A session. Thank you. Everybody, my name is Rahim and I'm the session chair. So I will read aloud some of these questions as an icebreaker, I would just start from my two short questions. Uh, so the first question is that uh, in defect of language priority, why adding more language is worse than the results? I could remember that adding uh, Dutch and English was the best, but not adding more languages. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so I think it has to do with the, the quality of the language uh, models because most of the uh, the research in language embeddings is is, is essentially biased towards english right so mm -hmm. uh, these english uh, data sets are, are are better uh and that is why uh, you will see that um combining multiple languages can actually deteriorate uh, the results mm -hmm. and have you tried like the combination of english maybe and german not in dutch but in deutsch yeah yeah we have tried multiple co of course we did not uh consider all 150 or so combinations that were possible mm -hmm. uh, with this package. Uh, we did uh, do uh, a permutation of the five languages that we considered. And mm -hmm. it turns out that uh, for this particular subset, uh, by chance, uh, Dutch uh, was the most effective to uh, combine with mm -hmm. English. There was no uh, national uh, bias because I'm Dutch or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sure. Okay, the second question is that regarding the overwhelming visual similarity scenario, did you observe the cases that hierarchical similarity not only helps, but also worsen the results? And if yes, how do we know when to make use of hierarchical similarity? Yeah, this is a, this is a very good question. Um, I don't have the answer. Uh, so uh, we didn't look into, into details where this was uh, the case. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we should. Yeah, very good question. Okay. So the third one is that in the earlier slides by Amir, he asked, you reviewed self-supervision, but it seems like data augmentation. Can we consider data augmentation as self-supervision action? Uh, yeah, in, 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 a, in a way they are related except that you with data augmentation you expand the data in self-supervision you really like try to learn uh, from the uh, augmentation process so to say mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. great so i would not consider it a, a self-supervised action but there is a relationship mm -hmm. so you may consider it maybe as a subset of data augmentation or so so i think You okay. Dr. Snook, I, I barely hear you. I guess we have some connection problems, or I have at least. Okay. Oh, pity. Okay. Uh, now it works, I guess. Yeah, it looks like the internet connection is very stable. Let's see how it goes. Okay. Maybe I can turn off my video. Maybe that helps. For now, it's okay. 
Okay. Um, so, shall we discuss the next question? Yes. Do you think hierarchical representation learning would be a good addition to graph convolutional networks for generation of images using scene graphs? Uh, yes, I think there is a, a nice uh, connection between the two. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is an interesting topic for, for future work. And we might see some of this work already in ECV. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which is happening this week. Mm -hmm. And the next one is by Sasan, who asked, if I'm not mistaken in this slide, where you calculated the speed of the wind by the image of the flag, the result is likely to be correlated with the angle of the picture taken. Is there a way to detect that all pictures have the same condition? Um, so it is, I believe it is true. Um, I, I think um, I'm not quite sure whether this is a strict requirement um, because you could easily also generate all kinds of other uh, uh, viewpoints and viewing conditions. Mm -hmm. um, that said, it should also not be very difficult to detect uh, the viewing angle of a flag in the wind. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay, and the other question, very long one by Faze. She asked that, uh, could you please explain the structure of the train data that has been used in the case that you had a semantic ambiguity problem? Uh, I don't know whether the structure of the train data, maybe the, the hierarchical structure she's asking for. Uh, uh, what chapter does this relate to, this question? I'm not sure. Maybe Faisa could tell us about this. I, I can answer about LSTMs in general. So mm -hmm. uh, what, what we have found in, in, in video analysis is that although LSTMs seem sort of like conceptually a very good fit, Right, because it's temporal sequence uh, data, it comes with memory. Uh, in all the experiments that, that we have tried and also that uh, colleagues uh, from other places have tried, uh, the LSTM has never been the convincing winner. So personally, I'm not so um, convinced of LSTMs being a good fit for uh, video. Uh, but of course, I, 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 I like to be wrong. So if you can show me otherwise, I will be very interested. Mm. Thanks. And the last but not least is by Farishdesh, who is asking for, in your work for object knowledge transfer, you have used nine dimensional search for spatial relations. Did you consider use graph convolution networks to model relationships between the objects and it, that it might give better results? Uh, well, so we, we can it simple uh, on purpose we we did experiment a little bit with uh, other uh, configurations like two by two for four by four and so on um, mind you that this is uh, zero shot so we cannot really learn a graph convolutional uh, network um, if you can somehow transfer that knowledge as well uh, we, we already know that graph convolutional networks are far more powerful than the simple uh, ad hoc uh, uh, nine cell uh, grids mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And maybe I can ask another question if time permits. Do you have a rough estimation how much hardware do you need for such an inference for resource constraint devices? I guess that would be very expensive, right? Uh, which one? Uh, the, the graph convolutional networks. Uh, yeah, this, yeah, that would also be computational uh, demands. Um, I did not really discuss the computational demands in my talk, but obviously for video, uh, they are humongous. But is it a real, like a, a, a real challenge in your works at all? Like, is it demanded by the community to, to push towards to, to this end? 
Well, you know, you see that um, the, the research labs from the big tech uh, companies like the Facebooks, the Googles and the Amazon, uh, they like to push uh, for solutions that need lots of compute. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, as an academic, I don't find it really interesting to, compu uh, to compete uh, with people who own the data and the compute. So mm -hmm. I'm far more interested in what can we do with, with less data, less compute, um, explainable solutions and also algorithms that have uh, less uh, bias right and i think all these four items are are highly correlated mm -hmm. and uh, the, then my question is that is it highly encouraged by like a lab like uh, qualcomm right um well i don't work at qualcomm but i, I collaborate with qualcomm mm -hmm. um of course qualcomm is an interesting uh, company in the sense that they uh, are inter they work with mobile phones they're the mobile phone uh, company right yes um so for uh, and they have a special interest in inference so inference has to be fast so that you can uh, deploy uh, video understanding algorithms mm -hmm. also on your uh, smartphone and i think that is one of the killer applications of the coming uh, uh, decade okay Great. Thanks. I don't see any more questions here. So with this, I will thank you again for participating. That was a great talk. I really enjoyed it. I guess all the participants have enjoyed the talk. Thanks thank a you. lot for having me. It was my pleasure. Bye bye. Bye. Okay. So Thanks all of the people who are attending this talk. So I guess we will meet tomorrow again. Thank you, bye.